Uh, tonight, as you know, we'll have our Westminster Standard Study and Fellowship and, and, and uh, Food Together. Uh, probably should have listed this in different order, but uh, Thursday, the lady study is postponed. Wednesday, a prayer and Bible study will be at 6.30. We'll have prayer together, psalm singing, and uh, enjoy a devotion together. We had uh, a hearty and full psalm sing uh, on Wednesday with prayer. It was really nice, so um, we'll probably shorten it up a little bit, but might do a little more of that. So if you have some of your favorite psalms to sing, feel free to make a request for that. We enjoyed that a lot together. That's all that I know to be announcing for this week. Let's prepare for worship together. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen, I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Let us lift our eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh our help? Our help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth, and dwellest in the heavens between the cherubim. Let us lift our eyes to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let us pray. We lift our eyes up unto the hills for our help. We lift our eyes up unto the heavens for our help. From the Lord God who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all them in them is. We lift our eyes to you, Lord Jesus, author and finisher of our faith. Thankful for these means of grace to help us persevere unto the end. We celebrate your resurrection today on the Lord's day. We anticipate our own in you. We look forward to the new heavens and the new earth. We look forward to Judgment Day, when all wrongs will be righted. We look forward, O oh Lord, when you vindicate your saints, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. Lord of lords, King of kings, God of gods, blessed be your name. We thank you that our names are written in the book of life. And we pray that you bless us with this abundant life on earth as we make ready for eternal life in heaven. Use these means of grace for your glory and for our growth and speak life into us, O Lord. Holy Spirit, speak your word and let us have ears to hear and let us be lifted up. Lord, we confess our sins before you. We acknowledge our weakness and dependence upon you, and we pray you strengthen us and that we would encourage ourselves in the Lord. Thank you for forgiving us of our many sins through Christ on the cross. Thank you for giving us eternal life through Christ's righteousness. Thank you for your grace upon grace. We approach your throne with confidence, seeking grace and mercy in our time of need. Remind us, renew us in the truth that your mercy endureth forever and is new every morning. Lift us up into the heavenlies, O Lord, and lift up our hearts and fill us with the joy of the Lord as our strength. And be thou glorified as we come to magnify you. We pray in Jesus' name, and all your people said, Amen. Amen. Beloved, open your Psalters with me to page 264, the second part of Psalm 119. And you'll notice it says, Beth, uh, each of these words, I think you probably know, but each of these words uh, at the top, 
are subheadings. They are there in the scriptures, and they are, uh, Psalm 119 is divided up by the Hebrew alphabet. So each of these is a section of the Hebrew alphabet in terms of um, uh, these titles. But we're going to sing the second part of Psalm 119 for a while, opening our evening service as we use Psalm 119 to open worship for a time. And of course, the, the overarching heart of, the, of it is God's Word, God's transforming, life-giving Word. And uh, so remember what we saw not long ago, that seven times that number of perfection in Psalm 119 is according to thy word. So we trust that according to God's word, he'll bless us, he'll lift us up. You see in the early verses, how can a young man purify his life? Of course, that's true for all of us, giving ourselves to God's word. I'll draw your attention tonight, especially to verses 13 and 14 as we ready for the sermon later. The judgments of thy mouth, each one my lips declared, have more joy thy testimonies weigh than riches all me gave. Uh, We're going to be looking at in the Proverbs tonight, chapter 12, verse 25, how uh, a heavy heart, uh, we can be ministers lifting up heavy hearts by speaking good words to people with heavy hearts. And uh, we can do like David and encourage ourselves in the Lord by speaking his words to us. Notice how it says, I have more joy in your testimonies, your judgments of thy mouth, my lips have declared. So we can speak the Lord's words. We can speak them to ourselves. We can be uh, rejoicing in the Lord by his very word for us. And of course, we want to be able to have that word to speak good words to others and help uh, heavy hearts be lifted up. Uh, Let's lift up our hearts before the Lord. Please stand as you are able. By what means shall a young man learn his way to purify? If he Open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. We continue reading through the New Testament together. This evening I will read for us verses 39 through 58 from the Gospel of Luke chapter 1.
Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 56. Hear now the word of the Lord. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salvation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath hope in his servant Israel and remembrance of his mercy." as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. So here we have uh, relatives uh, visiting. And remember, of course, John the Baptist and Jesus are related. And Mary and Elizabeth visit, and they're both with child. They're both pregnant. And you see the response of Jan, John the Baptist, which Elizabeth uh, mentions to Mary. As soon as I heard you, as soon as you were here, the babe leapt in my womb. <laughs> and uh, that's something we need to recognize again, uh, that children, even in the womb, can respond to and glorify the Lord. God's in charge of when someone has faith, young or old, and uh, they're certainly legitimately recognized uh, in the womb of a, of a person of God to be uh, God's people. And notice again, before there is even birth, there is a response. And of course, John the Baptist especially responds as this, because he's the one that will prepare the way for the Lord Jesus uh, when, they're, when they're men. And it's tremendous to be thinking about. Notice also this regular comment of holy. The Holy Ghost, um, the Elizabeth being holy. It's just the, the holy child we saw last time with Mary in your womb. Uh, God is going to make people holy through the Holy One, Jesus Christ. Uh, notice also um, in verse 46, I, I want to say this, is, I don't want to make too much out of it, but notice it says Mary said. It does not say Mary sang. The reason I point that out is this is often called the Mary's Magnificent, and it's kind of just assumed that it's a song. And sometimes people will point to this as a song in Scripture and something that could be used for worship. Uh, there are more specific issues related to what we can sing in worship and what we ought not, but just notice it doesn't actually say Mary sang. I think it's a proclamation. Recognize also, though, more importantly, what she says. This is a woman speaking. If you go back and you look through about God's defeating his enemies, remembering Israel, uh, it's pretty, pretty similar as I noted recently when we were looking at uh, the message that God is a rock, God is our rock, there's no rock like our God. And Hannah was uh, proclaiming in joy in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel uh, because you know, she was rejoicing that God gave her Samuel after weeping. Uh, but, but what she says about God in the broader context is quite striking, I think, for a woman in our times. And all I mean to say by that is notice how manly it is, or I guess I should say notice how confident it is in taking hope in the Lord God as our victor, uh, the one who will defeat our enemies, his and our enemies, and give us victory. Uh, this is the way the scriptures uh, look at God and salvation. 
Uh, and then notice also verse 50, his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. It's his mercy. It's his mercy. And notice, spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Uh, but notice this idea of mercy in verse 50. His mercy is on them again from generation to generation. He has saved his people because of his mercy. Verse 54, he hath hope in his serpent Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Uh, one of the psalms, uh, one of our ladies requested in so our psalm sing, the first one requested uh, on Wednesday night was Psalm 136, because 26 times his mercy endureth forever. And one of the things that psalm sang about is how the Lord delivered his people from King Zion and Og as they were about to go into the promised land or get close to going in. And that was significant and it's highlighted because those kings at the time were mighty and large. We were discussing how King Og, uh, how big he is, is even described by his bedposts. Big iron bedpost. <laughs> and God defeated them. No problem. God is always delivering his people from uh, the enemies, his enemies, delivering him from this world and its powerful clutches on us. But it's because of his mercy. His mercy endureth forever. We remember we have what we have in Christ by mercy, by grace. He's merciful. And then notice also um, he's, he helps the humble. Notice the kinds of things uh, that she's saying here. For he hath regarded, verse 48, he regardeth the low estate. Of course, Peter says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he shall lift you up. God gives grace to the humble, the scriptures say. He humbles the proud, but he gives grace and mercy and delivers the humble. May we humble ourselves before the Lord that he would lift us up. Let us pray. Lord, we do indeed rejoice. Another theme we saw there was much rejoicing of Elizabeth, much rejoicing of Mary in your salvation and deliverance from this world that comes through the incarnate Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to pay for our sins in our flesh and soul and to rise from the dead as the first fruits of our resurrection, who has already conquered Satan stepped on his head on the cross and is sitting on his throne, reigning, ruling everything and will come again to judge the quick and the dead. We rejoice in you, Lord Jesus Christ. We and our children, we rejoice in you. Lord, may we indeed at the, at the hearing of your voice in the scriptures, in your preaching, may we rejoice May we leap with joy, like John the Baptist, like Elizabeth, like Mary, like Zacchaeus, for salvation has come to our house and to our hearts. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins and for the promise of the resurrection from the dead. Lord God, we do pray for special comfort in the hope of Jesus and the joy of his salvation and the promise of the resurrection, especially for Dr. Jeff Stuyvesant and his children, Nathan and Abigail and his church, Grace Reformed Presbyterian Church and even the RPTS community. We ask, Lord, for healing mercies, for comfort in the Holy Spirit and for the comfort and assurance of the resurrection that is our hope. We do pray for comfort. Lord, we ask for healing for all those in need of healing in our church. And we especially lift up and ask your blessing on Elder Renner's knee that you'll help him make progress every day at the appropriate rate that it will be sustainable. And Lord, that he will in due season uh, have a, a new step on life, a new uh, healing and rejuvenation and uh, freedom from pain uh, that it was necessary to go through now to have that later. We just ask also your blessing on Mr. Kalukas. We'll meet with a doctor this week to seek out what needs to be done for his prostrate. And we ask, Lord, that um, you will just uh, protect him and help him. And Lord, provide what is best for him to have healing and strength. 
We pray your healing mercies over uh, Chuck and Jan Vermillion and all their needs. We do lift up Becky and pray for comfort and strength. Pray for healing in the Van Leuven household, especially for Carmelita. And Lord, we do lift up this day to you and thank you for it. We thank you for the rain last night. We thank you for the sunshine today. We thank you for how the property is progressing and pray your blessing on it all for Mr. Harrigan. And we pray your anointing over that place that it will be indeed what it will be named, the village of peace, and that it will reflect the peace of Christ. And Lord, that it will even be reflected in those who would live there and worship you with us here. We pray for your mercy to meet all of our needs, physical, spiritual, Pray that you help us to be content as we'll study this evening in the 10th commandment. For you will never leave us nor forsake us. And if we have Christ, we have everything. As Psalm 73 speaks, the Lord God is all we need in heaven and earth. For you are the strength of our heart and our portion forever. Yet we acknowledge before you, Lord, that we are weak that we have many uh, things that are heavy on our hearts. So, Lord, speak to our hearts good words and lift us up. And let these words be what comes out of our heart and our mouths to others to lift them up. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all your people said, Amen. Beloved, would you open your Psalters with me to, with me to page 287? Page 287. <clears throat> we often sing this psalm, uh, and we sang this in Psalm 133 very often when we were going through Philippians because it's so much related to so much of Paul's concern for unity and brotherhood. Notice verse 1, I joyed. Again, when we go up to the house, we said, I joyed. When they said, let's go to the house of God, I rejoiced. And as we think about speaking good words to one another and helping heavy hearts to rejoice, we invite people, let's go to church. Let's go to worship God. Let's go encourage ourselves in the Lord and praise his name. Um, look at verse 8 with me, especially now for my friends and brethren's sake, peace be in thee, I'll say. Again, in Proverbs tonight, we're going to be looking at how we speak good words to people, and it alleviates a heavy heart. It lifts up and relieves and lightens a heavy heart. So may we say this to one another tonight. May we be lifted up and encouraged. We all have our burdens. We all have our things that make our hearts heavy, but let us rejoice in our fellowship together as we say to one another, as we sing this psalm, peace to my brethren. I say peace to you. You say peace to me in the Lord. Please stand. Da 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 I joyed when to the house of God go up they said to me Jerusalem with shall standing be Jerusalem as a city is compactly built together unto that place the tribes go to Israel's testimony there, to God's name thanks to pay for thrones of judgment, even the thrones of David's house there stay. Let them that 
deity. Therefore, I wish that peace may still within thy walls remain, and ever may thy palaces prosper. Now for my friends and brethren's sakes, peace be in thee, I'll say. And for the house of God, our Lord, I'll see thy good. Amen. Please be seated and open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 12. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Beloved, the Lord speaks to you this evening through his living, holy, powerful, life-changing, life-guiding word in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Let me read it for you now. Hear the word of the Lord. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. Let me read that again. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. This morning we learned in Proverbs eleven fourteen to seek safety in many counselors. Tonight we're going to learn how to counsel others, those who need help and may come to us. I want you to think about a deflated balloon. It's not been blown up or the air has been taken out of it. It simply lies lifeless. It doesn't make children smile. Think instead of a balloon that is robust with air. It's shiny and it playfully races in gusts of wind and kids have fun with them, chasing them around and maybe popping them sometimes. Kids have fun with them even raising their hair or sticking them to walls with static electricity. Even more, think of a balloon inflated with helium. You can tie it to a string and walk it around. It'll follow you in the air lightly or let it go and it rises up into the heavens. And this is the difference that you can make in people's lives with how you speak to them when they're deflated when they're laid low, as we see in our text, by heaviness in the heart, heavy things that weigh upon our hearts, weigh upon our shoulders. It actually makes us stoop, makes our shoulders go down, makes us have a, uh, a posture of being worn out and weary. And you have the opportunity of blowing air back into that soul and lifting it up. Troubled hearts that are laid low can be lifted up by speaking good words into them. I give you that as the idea of the text, which is essentially the same of the short verse. Troubled hearts that are laid low can be lifted up by speaking good words into them. I want you to see the power you have. We've often looked at that, the power of words. They can do harm. Proverbs warn about much of that. But tonight it only focuses on the good that they can do. They can do much good if we think to use our words this way. Now, the word heaviness in Hebrew could be afflicted. And notice in contrast with good. 
And actually, that uh, I think my <laughs> I think my computer changed the word. It should be uh, it can be related to having anxiety. The heaviness can be related to anxiety, or the idea of anxiety could be translated it. Now notice the contrast. There's a few contrasts going out here, uh, going on, and the contrast is important to look at. We can go from this place to this place by doing something. Uh, notice anxiety, uh, certainly affliction or heaviness of soul is in contrast with good, with something good. Notice the contrast of the heart and word. You see the outward, trusting it's coming from your heart, can influence the inward. Think about that. Words get into the ears, into the heart. You can do something to that heavy heart. Also see the contrast of the before and after effect of speaking a good word into a heavy heart and what it can do. Now, a heavy heart maketh a person stoop. Makes it like this. But giving a good word into that heavy heart maketh it glad. Could be translated, makes it rejoice. You know, think about the contrast there. You know, the heaviness and then the rejoicing. <gasps> this, of course, just the kind of straightening back up and the breathing in of air and rejoicing and laughing. That's what you can do with your good words. You see, hope brings happiness. And this comes from you who are willing to help a heavy heart. Proverbs 16, verse 24. Pleasant words are as in honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones, a certain kind of word, pleasant words, good words. Proverbs 12, 18, close to our verse this evening. There is that speaketh like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. You have to be careful. There's a certain way that you can speak that can cut people off and leave them bleeding. But you can also choose to be one of healing. The tongue of the wise is health. The tongue of the wise can speak good and pleasant words into a heavy heart and make a difference, a healing difference. I do want to remind you, as I often do on this subject, because I, I know it bears repeating for all of us. I know it does for me of what I learned in poetry class in college. Sarcasm is something to avoid. It means in the Greek to cut the flesh. And that is certainly not going to heal the heart. Your words are to bring healing, health, not make people bleed and seek bandages after you pass by. Keep in mind that wise counsel wisely knows the time and place. There's different words that are good to speak in different times and different places. And so we need wisdom and we need to know the word and know which word is the best to speak. Keep in mind Proverbs 25 verse 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. A word fitly spoken. So a word spoken out of order or unfit or inappropriate at a certain time, of course, is the opposite. So we want to be careful about speaking words that are fit for the occasion, fit for the situation, because we're concerned not about ourselves. We're concerned about helping the other person. Sometimes the good word to speak is Romans 8.28. We know that God works all things to the good of them that love him, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And uh, tenderly, carefully helping a person accept and work with difficult providences. Sometimes 1 Corinthians 15, as is the word that was preached this morning in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania, to comfort our our brethren, the Stuyvesant family, and the loss of their wife a few days ago, speaking the promise of the resurrection. 
not overlooking the sorrow of loss of a loved one to the grave, but being encouraged about the truth and the hope of Christianity being raised from the grave. Oftentimes, speaking a good word will be uh, through all kinds of difficult providences, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 9. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. One of the wonderful things of that scripture is that it recognizes difficulty and pain and struggle. It allows you to own it, similar to Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. We've often considered with it, and yet it helps you know how you would have that uh, Weeping or sorrow that is not like the world, but has hope and strengthening and encouraging through it. And naturally, there are many scriptures that uh, would we often write to one another. Isaiah 40, they that wait on the Lord will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. Other scriptures in Isaiah nearby, such as he will be with you through the water and through the fire. Our memory verse this evening, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Many of these kinds of scriptures are good words. And so, frankly, beloved, one of the things you really want to be ready is to have God's good word on a number of different topics in you, near you. Uh, I was encouraged to hear from our, our brother, uh, uh, Matthew, uh, while he was away uh, on the ship. Uh, he was able to share much of what the Lord's been giving him here with others. And sometimes uh, he said some people cried and uh, sometimes they had nothing to say. They were kind of in awe. And in particular, one of them was 1 Corinthians 13, which we're studying in our men's study and what it said and how people were amazed by it. And having these words ready to be able to speak, and there's nothing m more pleasant or good than God's word. The right ones fitly at the right times, but have God's word ready to share. Sometimes speaking a good word to bring healing and lift up a heavy heart can be hard to hear. It certainly needs to have in view how you bring it across, but Proverbs 27, verse 6, for instance, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You, you, you don't want to burst anyone's balloon, but sometimes we do need to prick the skin so the infection can start to come out and real healing can begin. We want to be calling heavy laden people, weary people to Jesus whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. Call them to Jesus, straight to Jesus, who gives a peace of God that's not of this world, passes all understanding. Speak his words. Speak words that help guide their eyes to the light of hope such as Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Beloved, take them outside. Almost anywhere you are in Southern California, we have the advantage of, come here with me, please. And look up to the hills together. Have that word on your heart. If you don't, open it up and just read it and then pray it and trust that God's living word can minister, but be willing to do these things. Help lift up a heavy heart, sometimes with levity. Proverbs 15, verse 13, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but a, by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Or Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. One of those concerns why we would want to be lifting up 
a heavy heart that stoops us down. And of course, that idea of stooping, the Hebrew has the idea of, could just be that it we bow down, we're bent over in grief or sorrow. And I know that there were times in some of our family's uh, greatest grief over the last decade where uh, sometimes we chose to take a, bre a break from the grief and we deliberately found something comedic to make us laugh, you know, in between the tears, in between the sorrows. And it was helpful. It's just sometimes you got to take a break to have a laugh just because it's all right and you need it. It doesn't mean you forget where you are, what you're going through, but it's okay to just let yourself have a moment of merriment. But of course, again, it has to be fit at the right time. It isn't always right. It's not always the right time to be silly. Uh, still, even a good cry can bring release and smiles. How many times have we ended a time of crying with some saying, oh, I feel better. There's almost a little laughter with it. I feel better. I needed a good cry. Sometimes you have to be able to, to, to let it out to be lifted up. And we need the help of our brethren to remind us, speaking supportive words to do that in a, in a culture that is too often trying to pretend that we all got it together and we don't have any problems, <laughs> which means we're lying to ourselves and one another almost 24-7. Our strength is only from the Lord. Our being lifted up is only from the Lord. And the Lord uses the means of his people to speak such life, such lifting up of hearts with his word through the mouths of his people. And helping one grieve can be good. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 3, sorrow is better than laughter sometimes. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Pray for wisdom and seek many counselors to help advise you in offering more help and discern what is best for what person at what time and what situation. And we're all made differently. Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 and 4 to everything. There is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Sometimes telling someone what time it is and helping them embrace it for what it is, is a good word to speak into their heavy heart. We we'll often need help, there's guidance along recognize where we are and what we can do about it and where we need to go. Even think of in Nehemiah, uh, the, uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Why does he say that in context? They're weeping because the rediscovery of the law and they're recognizing how much they have not done God's law and they're heartbroken over it. But Nehemiah is saying we're being restored unto the Lord now. No more weeping. There's a time for that. But it isn't to go forever. Let us now rejoice with the strength of the Lord, the joy of the Lord as our strength. So sometimes just helping people navigate and transition from one place to the next. Often, beloved, you can simply say this. I'll do, I'll do these really slow so that you can memorize them and have them ready at any moment. Are you ready? I love you. And men, you can say that to men. Don't get me going with holy kisses with David and uh, Jonathan for another sermon. <laughs> Some of you are saying, how long can that be delayed? <laughs> but we, we need to say, I love you. And, you know, right now, as I've been comforting a brother, uh, I am profuse with closing with my salutation love grant and that's what we need to do just hearing someone say I love you can go a long way say all right this is a little longer um, and ironically I've spelled it wrong but that, that's appropriate in this case I'm here for you and, and say that 
not just in an email or please don't just say that in a text, <laughs> you know, say it beside them, seek them out. But it's funny, I, I wrote it H-E-A-R, I'm here for you, but of course, isn't that so much of it, I'm here for you, uh, to listen. I recall, uh, I think it was you, Mr. Vermillion, that shared those lovely stories, and one of them was um, uh, a young boy went to his neighbor's house, an older man who had lost his wife, and uh, he, he was just sitting there on the, on, the, um, on the porch, and I think they asked him, what did you say? I didn't say anything, I just cried with him, something along those lines, and how healing that is. Listening is the greatest language of love. The power of presence speaks volumes. In a busy world where we're largely passing ships, you care enough to sit with me? Really? You can say a lot to people like that. You can say these three words. Okay. Write this down on your heart. God forgives you. I forgive you. If they are not a Christian, God can forgive you. You can be forgiven. How many things have our hearts weighed down because of our sins? Jesus saves sinners. All right, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, here's a five word. I'm just having a little fun with you to really put these in your tool belt. So simple, and we, we can tend to make it more complicated and then miss many moments where we could provide healing. Be ready to say this. May I pray for you. How many times do we listen to someone and discuss their situation and say, I'll pray for you, if we say that? May I pray for you. And when they say yes, you pray for them. Mindful that Jesus talks about don't be praying in the streets for everyone to see you. Find a quiet corner to pray, but pray for them. Speak good words into their hearts, praying for them. And if they are uncertain, if they avoid it, then sneak a quick prayer in and over them yet still. What are they going to do? <laughs> Get a word in there. Regardless of the time and the place and what's fitting, Colossians 4 verse 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Of course, that involves saying something. More on that in a moment. Seasoned with salt. We've looked at what salt can represent. We are the salt of the earth. Just have in view these things. Salt is uh, preventative, right? It's a preservative. Uh, I think that's probably most in view with what Jesus says, but there's more than that. Uh, salt can bring flavor, uh, but it can bring healing. Uh, yeah, I, think it was, I think it was last Lord's Day in the morning. I was going too quickly. I, I should have I switched my razor blades. And I have one of those things where you take the one out and stick the other in and tighten it up, you know. And I, I, it's ridiculous because I, I bought one of those bulk things of blades. I probably have enough blades to last myself and several more generations to come. You know, I'm not going to run out of these things. But I wait too long and going too fast. And because it was dull, I, I cut myself. And Fernanda has um, this special salt that you can use to put in a little wound like that. And it stops the bleeding. And that's what our words are supposed to be like. It's supposed to be seasoned with salt. Stop the bleeding of these bleeding hearts, hurting hearts, heavy hearts. Healing. 
Now, something else to challenge you with. Oh, yes, you can. It's not brother or sister's job. It's your job. Your brothers and sisters, yes, and you, you're going to need you too. And it's not just the pastor's job as much as he loves to do it. He's only one person. And uh, we let others in sometimes more than the pastor. Uh, it's everyone's job and everyone's ability. And I would remind you, you are all competent to counsel. And this is the name of the main book by J. Adams in the New Thetic Counseling Movement. And it simply is relying on Romans 15, verse 14. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness. Well, you can speak a good word then. Filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. And the Greek word for admonish, nutheo, is where they get the phrase nuthetic counseling. It just means, you know, counseling, advise, can be rebuked, but it's that broader idea of advising and counseling one another. You're all competent to counsel because you all have the word of God. Some of us are trained and called to assist you with that, and so we have to make sure we give extra study to show ourselves approved to do that, but it doesn't rule out all of your ministry to one another in the world. Having God's word, speaking what you know, speaking what you can, because you're going to be out there in the world in all these different places that I won't, that your elders won't, to be salt. And to one another. One of the reasons people pay for counseling, and I know this from testimony to me from people, is because they need someone to listen. They need someone to express interest and compassion. As I think most of you know, I was exploring for a tent making job that would have wouldn't have been able to be that much of the picture of the pie, but I was looking at uh, Navy chaplaincy in the reserves this week. And the, the one that does the recruiting, a man who's also, he's a pastor and he's a Navy chaplain, he said to me, it's desperately needed. He's talked about the military and the difficulties there and so many crazy things going on. And he says, you can't talk to anyone, you can't cry, you can't show emotion. And the only person you can talk to is the chaplain. And we desperately need more chaplains. And one of the things he spoke to is the fact that there is a higher suicide rate with our armed forces because of that context. We need to be speaking one to another. We need to be offering someone, some place I can talk to. I can listen. They don't need to go pay for it. They can just come have a friend. Now, some people are really paying for friends. The scriptures speak about there's not that many out there. And there's only a few that stick closer than a brother. By the way, that's coming from Proverbs. <laughs> Be a friend. Not that many people are actually willing to listen and then really listen. Sometimes it's obvious because they literally get up and leave before the conversation has ended, sometimes in mid-sentence. And you start to learn, I'm not going to bear my soul to that person because they're not even listening. And that hurts. We need to give time to one another. We need to have time to reflect on what's being shared with us so we have an idea of what to say back or other questions to ask. And sometimes we need help just counseling ourselves and being able to talk to someone else helps us think through our thoughts. We ought to be offering free friendship, free gospel grace, counseling to one another in the world. And I was thinking after that conversation, we have military housing all around us here, and maybe we need to develop a track that says, we're here for you. Do you need someone to talk to? We have an ear for listening. Romans 12, verse 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. 
let them enjoy your laughter with them in their happy moments. I'm so happy for you. I praise the Lord. I rejoice for you. And let them listen to your tears in their weeping. Don't make light of things, but help lighten their burden. It's amazing how you can carry something when you, you just have one other person. <laughs> I was teaching the little guys the other week. I brought home a big box of diapers, and, and uh, one wanted to carry. So I think you probably both should take an end, you know, and at first, no, I'm strong. Oh, yeah, that's good. You take the other side, you know. <laughs> and it's the same thing with lots of things in life, you know. You, you get a few more people lifting that thing with you, and it's much more able to bear. We need to help one another lift one another up by carrying one another's burdens. In particular, we're focusing on that because tonight the idea is the heaviness in the heart that makes a man stoop and how we can help lift their burden by a good word to make the heart glad and lift them up. Encourage. Affirm. And by the way, be proactive about that as well. You know, be kind of getting air in people all the time. I remember when we had our study a while ago on affirmation, uh, Sam Crabtree's book. Some of the elders, we went to uh, uh, his conference on that and have the book, and we studied it. And he said, you know, you really need to make sure uh, for every one correction or, uh, you know, Censor some kind of criticism, and there's a place for those things. You, you should have three to five affirmations. So think about that. Are, are you going out of your way proactively to affirm one another? Uh, sometimes to counteract things that shouldn't have even been said, but even to just put in a helpful context uh, a wound that needs to be made by a friend at times. Affirm. Come alongside speak life beloved do not be like Job's friends in their trouble in his troubles remember we've looked at that recently such sorrow such anguish literally stooped down not only from his heart but his literal body such loss and they spent most of the book not a short book criticizing them him and expressing you probably brought this on yourself which was just to bring insult to injury and it didn't heal, and he lamented that, and God corrected them for it. Be like Christ to his friends. John 16, These things have I spoken. These things I have spoken unto you. That in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And just have a cheery joy to come be together and worship as we always sing outside the church before we enter into morning worship. Uh, I joyed when they say, let us go to the house of the Lord. As you sang this evening, in particular, verse 8, for my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, peace be within thee. How nice to hear that. When we sang that together this evening and as we looked at each other singing it, I, I was touched just to say to one another, I pray for your peace, my brethren, my friends. I pray for your uh, prosperity. I pray for your felicity. What a lovely thing to say. But beloved, say something like that. And uh, uh, here, here's another thing, not something to say, but something I want to say to you. Say something. Some of us know what it is to be in deep moments of grief and startled that when you share your situation, even some Christians literally don't respond with their mouth and walk away. And sometimes there's not a more lonely experience in all the world. Say something. Because saying something shows you see them. 
and you care for them. You don't have to say a lot. Just think of the golden rule. R.F. Horton has some things to say about this uh, in his uh, notes on this verse. The pleasant words spoken out of a kindly and gentle nature have a purifying effect. They cleanse away the defilements out of which the evil passions sprang. They purge the deceased humors which produce the irritations of life. They supply a sweet food to the poor hearts of men who are often contentious because they are hungry for sympathy and love. He goes on to say, what a different world this would become if we all spoke as many pleasant words as we honestly could. And we're not so painfully afraid of showing what tenderness and pity and healing exist in our hearts. There are these stooping, bowed down hearts everywhere around us. We wish that we could remove the cause of sorrow, that we could effectually change the conditions which seem unfavorable to joy. But by being unable to do this, we often stand aloof and remain silent. Because we shrink from giving words without deeds, pity without relief. We forget that when the heart is heavy, it is just a good word that maketh it glad. Yes, a word of genuine sympathy, a word from the heart. And in trouble, no other word can be called good will often do more to revive the drooping spirit than the grosser gifts of material wealth. A gift card is nice. A word is best. They are not mutually exclusive. Lastly, he says this, the seasonable word spoken just at the right moment and just in the right tone, brief and simple, but comprehending and penetrating will often make the sad heart sing a song for itself. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. Let me read that last line again from R. F. Horton. The seasonable word spoken just at the right moment and just in the right tone, brief and simple, but comprehending and penetrating, will often make the sad heart sing a song for itself. Beloved, let it be that when you leave the room of mourning or anxiety, it is said by the one that you spoke to based on what you said to them, trusting you said something. Let it be said of you after you've left. He was like a breath of fresh air. She was like a breath of fresh air. I feel filled up. Beloved, lift up heavy hearts by filling them up with good words. And that is the message for you this evening from the text. Lift up heavy hearts by filling them up with good words.
And I promise you, if you will, you will change the world. And you will have people following you to this church. Let us pray. Lord God in heaven, forgive us for how often we default to foolish words, careless words, casual discussions. And we aren't willing to go deep to the heart. And we're often intimidated and move away from someone when we see a heavy heart. When we of all people should be the one they can talk to, confide in, receive a compassionate ear and a kind tongue of healing. Lord, let us have your words and your spirit and indeed be salt to the earth and salt to the wounds of hearts even when we may, as a good friend, sometimes need to be bringing those wounds for real healing. Let us have all the other words to help receive the care and to work through the healing afterwards. Lord, let us look for opportunities and look for words to say and keep some of these with us all the time, remembering how much it helps for us. Remembering how much someone has healed us with their words. And let us be eager to do the same for others. Thinking of the golden rule. And thank you, Lord God, for speaking your healing good words to us in your holy word. And thank you for speaking to our heart, Holy Spirit, that we can hear you and receive your healing and help. And as we would humble ourselves under your heavy hand, that you would lift us up in due time. And thank you for the promise that we can cling to in our hearts of the hope of the resurrection that will not disappoint and is the anchor of our souls. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all your people said, Amen. Amen. Beloved, let us open our Psalters to Psalm 67, page 133. Page 133, Psalm 67, as you are able, please stand. Da, 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 da. Lord, bless and pity us. Shine on us with thy face that the earth thy way and nations all may know thy saving grace. Let Beloved, prepare to receive God's loving words of his benediction upon you. But before he gives you those words, may I say these words to you. I love you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our food and fellowship. Lord, thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for the food of your word. Bless us to be ministers of grace and healing with your word in our words, speaking straight to the hearts of those who need to be heard and spoken to by you. And Lord, we do thank you that we can enjoy fellowship, the wonderful privilege and blessing we have of our brethren to now go eat and drink. And we do thank you for the more than competent portion of the good things of this life. And we pray you would bless us to enjoy your blessing in it as we eat and drink to your glory. Thankful we don't go hungry to bed. And when we rise, we have more than we need. Lord, let us be generous with others and gracious as you have been to us. And bless our fellowship, Lord. Let it be food to the soul as well. And we thank you in Jesus' name and all your people said.